for that. Well, I'm not actually planning on going crazy. Oh. Okay. Um, great. So I guess um, I guess we should go on. Uh, so I posted new homework questions to cover. Um, uh, so the new homework is up. New homework is going to cover. Right now, I've got questions from five A and five B. Um, these sections are really important, so it's going to seem like a lot of questions, but most of, like a, a good portion of them are construct an example type questions, right? But I don't know if you guys noticed, but the class is starting to get like this portion of the course is harder than the portion that came earlier in the course, and it continues to be hard, and it actually might continue getting harder as the, as the, as the course goes as well. So don't take your foot off the gas as far as um, the work that you're putting in here. The reason I'm offering a lot of questions is to give you an opportunity to try these things enough to get the ideas in your head. So the first thing I want to talk about today is um, uh, I want to talk about what an operator is because we're going to, I got asked this question in office hours. It was a totally legit, legit question. Um, I deliberately didn't spend a lot of time talking about operators last week, um, but basically for the rest of the course, operators will be the main object of study. So an operator, operator um, is a map T contained in the linear maps from a vector space into itself. Are we in five now? This this was in chapter at the end of chapter three, but we're moving into chapter five, and chapter five is all about operators. Okay. okay? So I'm going to start by talking about operators and the theorem that characterizes their behavior. And then we're going to start talking about the chapter five content. So this is sort of an intro to chapter five is operators. Axer just kind of tosses it in at the end of 3D. And I want to make sure that we actually like, we are going to be studying operators in the context of chapter five. So we're, we're going to do eigenvalues basically. And eigenvalues are related to operators. Um, and that's it. Um, don't be confused by the notation LV. If there's only one vector space, it just that's, I mean, it's the same thing. LV is just a shorthand way of writing in your map from a vector space to itself. You can think about operators are sort of like square matrices. If you like to have them, it's never a, a terrible idea to have matrix analogies for the ideas running around in your head. An operator is like a square matrix. Okay, so when you did 206 or wherever you did your linear algebra, you focused at some point. You did like p parts of the invertible matrix theorem and then studied eigenvalues and that's kind of what we're doing here in the more general setting the nice thing about operators is you have this theorem that characterizes when they're invertible so if p is an operator i guess we should say be careful here and say he is finite dimensional Then the following are equivalent. I don't know if we've done a following or equivalent argument in here yet. I'm going to point something out. The following are equivalent. A is invertible. B is objective. C is objective. This is not true for general maps, but it is true for operators. For an operator, to be injective is to be invertible. Or to be surjective is to be invertible. Frequently, the easiest condition to check is injectivity. And then you get invertibility for free. So a lot of you guys are sort of fresh out of 248. How do you prove it's an equivalence? How would we do this to show that all these statements are Yeah, and easy. So that, that those can be complicated webs, right? But we're going to do this in a really straightforward way. We're going to do A implies B implies C implies A. So that if one of them is true, they're all true, right? Any one of them implies all the rest of them in a circle. Yep. So 
I remember there's a theorem where it said like if t is bijective, then it is invertible, and yes. that applies to general math, right? That does apply to general math. So A implies B is immediate, right? <coughs> invertible, invertible is automatically objective. Yeah, but that's only applied for like an operator, right? When t's go from b to v, but if it's go from v oh, I mean, but I mean, any theorem that applies to linear maps from v to w also applies to map from v to v, right? So we we all we still know that inject in, that uh, invertible means injective and uh, and surjective. The point here is that this we already know that this by definition is this and this. Yeah. What I'm trying to show is that just one of these is enough to get invertible. Before we had a theorem that said invertible was invertible was injective and surjective. But now we're trying to cut it down so that we're saying that's the general linear map case. Now we're saying we just want to talk about injective is enough to, to recover the invertibility. Yep. Okay. If you were to prove that there's two injective and that's called two surjective and done. So and uh, yeah, there's so uh, this is a, so we're taking time to talk about this because of the structure of the argument. So what you're saying is, you could you could show if you could do this, if you could show that B implied C, which implied B, somehow you have to get A into the mix too, right? Yeah, I mean, so like A gets you, A gets you B. Yeah, I mean, you could you could set the web up this way too. Yeah. I think it's actually just the, the point is that like yeah you can make you can make more complicated structures here, and in fact when you go to your higher level classes there might be theorems that have like six equivalences and complicated webs of uh, equations. Yep. So if uh, for operators if it's not injective then it applies like it can't be invertible. Okay. Or yeah. Surjective. Yeah. So we're at, and we're going to use we're actually going to like today probably we're going to use the um, negation of this which is if any one of these is false they're all false. So they're simultaneously true or simultaneously false. Right? Okay, so this is how we're going to do this. A implies B. Here we go. Clear. Yeah. Why is it clear? Because invertible implies injective. It's part of the definition. That definition. Invertible implies injective. How am I going to do B implies C? Injective implies surjective. You need to like the uh, if then B equals. Yeah, C. yeah. I think a couple of people here. What you're saying is right, but the way you want to do it is what you guys are saying. You just want to use the fundamental theorem of linear paths to meet you. Know, so what you would say is assume T is injective. What does that mean in terms of dimension of some space? If T is injective, what do we know? No, dimension of the null space of T is equal to zero. But then the fundamental theorem of linear map says the dimension of B is equal to the dimension of the range of T plus the dimension of the null space of T. But if this is zero, it means the dimension of V is equal to the dimension of the range of t, and that means that b is the range of t. So this implies that t is surjective. Yep. It's really like, yeah, so like, I, I should be more clear about what's going on here. I mean, yeah, there's a little bit more going on, which is to say, but the, 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 what's really going on here is that this works because the range, because the T takes V into itself. We have the dimension of V is equal to the dimension of the range of T, but the range of T is contained in V because T takes V into itself, right? Well, if I have a subspace with the same dimension as the big space, then the spaces are equal to each other. I have range of T, it's a subspace of V, and the dimension of the range of T is equal to the dimension of V, and those two things together require that V is equal to the range of T. So yeah, you're right. Absolutely, it's the case here. This requires, the fact that the range of T is contained in V is because we're talking about operators. 
So we couldn't use this theorem. You might think, well, why do we have to do operators? Why can't we just use vector spaces of the same size? This argument doesn't work because the range of T is not a subspace of the original space in that case. Okay. So if V, if all of V is in the range of T, that means that T is surjective. So how about C implies A? T is surjective, which means what? Range of T is equal to V. So again, the dimension of V is equal to the dimension of the range of T plus the dimension of the null space of T. What does that mean about these two numbers? They're the same. So what does that mean about the dimension of the null space of T? Ah, so the dimension of the null space of T is nothing. And that means T is injective. But the map that is surjective and injective is invertible. So therefore, T is invertible and C implies A. Therefore, T is invertible. Okay, now this is not a complicated argument, but this structure where we have a ring of implications is something that starts coming up more and more. It's not us starting to be more sophisticated. Okay. okay, questions about this argument before we go on? Yep. It's only because T takes V on to V, or you couldn't say this. Okay. This wouldn't be true. So even if V and W are the same size, you can sort of cheat the idea that this still works. There's a version of this theorem that holds for vector spaces of the same size, but you can't use this argument. It's more complicated okay. than this. Okay, so if you take the map beyond W, but you need to look at the vector that say You would have to do a different argument to get there. Okay. Well, that like Because you'd have to like, I mean, one way of doing that would be put everything into matrices and then show that the matrix was invertible, and that would mean that the map was invertible. Right, it's it's a harder argument to do that. This is an immediate. I mean, this is the reason you do operators is because ranges live in the space that you started with. Right, domains and ranges live in the same space. Anything else? If you want, you can try to prove it with the TW. Well, is that going to be? No, we don't. No, we are going to. We're like I said, for all this eigenvalue stuff, we are concerning ourselves only with operators, maps from the vector space to itself. This is why we put this here. Okay, so let's talk about eigenvalues. A subject that my experience suggests people come out of 206 understanding with a wide range of means of understanding. So, the basic idea of what we want to do now is that we want to. Study a map, study an operator um, by looking at it on smaller pieces, by breaking it up into pieces. This is sort of one of the core ideas of mathematics used to investigate questions is like, um, if I can take something complicated and break into easy pieces, then it's easier to understand, right? Like look at small, easy pieces and then build them back up to a big complicated thing. So uh, one of the ideas that you might have to do that would be, well, suppose that T was a linear map on some vector space V. And let's suppose that V could be chopped up into pieces in a direct sum, V1, direct sum, V2, direct sum out to, I don't know, UM. So the vector space could be cut into these pieces. This is a way of breaking the vector space down into pieces that are smaller and easier to understand, right? So the vector space, this breaks the vector space into small pieces. And maybe we can use that idea to break an operator into small pieces too. So what if we did this? What if we said, okay, well, maybe I could try to understand T, we'll use a symbol we haven't used here before, but restricted to the vector space like U1, say. This is what this symbol means is T 
where instead of all of V being the input, I just let T be applied to U1 as the domain. It's okay to apply an operator to a subspace. T is the same T from before, but I'm just saying I'm only going to get to you. T originally acted on V, but now I'm restricting it down to just this part of V. Right? So this is a smaller thing. It's easy to understand because I've drastically restricted the inputs that it takes. Okay? U1 is a subspace. This is legal. Um, but in order to be totally awesome, we really like to be what happens here that what should be here to make this problem make sense? If I want T, if I want to understand T in a simple way, I want to chop it up into pieces and I want to restrict it to U1, I'm only going to feed it inputs from U1. What would I really hope the outputs of T look like? They should also probably live in U1 if I want T1 to be broken to this small piece on U1. The problem is that's generally not true. Just because I restrict the inputs of T to U1, this could be all of V. Generally, T restricted to U1 might not, or might send V in U1 outside of U1. That seems like it defeats the purpose, right? We took the vector space and broke into these pieces. We can take T and apply it to each one of those pieces, but if T takes an input in U1 and spreads it all over the place, I haven't made my life any easier. So the idea is what I'd really like to be able to do, I don't want to color chalk, I can use to write this. What I really want to be able to do is to say, in some sense, I'd really hope that the symbol I'm going to write down doesn't make any sense, but I'm kind of convincing what the point of this is. I really want to be able to say T is equal to T restricted to U1. I'm going to use a direct sum here. Don't worry if it doesn't mean anything. The idea is if I can break the vector space down, is there a way that I can also break T up into the piece that acts on U1 and a piece that acts on U2 and a piece that acts on U3 all the way out, right? If I could do that, it'd be really easy to understand a linear operator. I could chop the vector space apart and that would let me chop T apart. Something complicated into something simple. The problem is this doesn't work if that space is not also U1. If U1 doesn't get sent to U1, I can't do this. So that's kind of what motivates where eigenvalues come from. Because I want to be able to say, I took a vector space and cut it apart. I would really like that also to cut apart the operator as well. So regardless of how well you understand my attempt at trying to motivate what's happening here, the basic idea is I'd really like to be able to pull T apart into simple pieces. In order to do that, I'm going to have to make sure that there are spaces where T takes in a subspace and spits that same subspace back out. Okay. So the upshot of this is subspaces that map into themselves. Are important. Give them a name. Definition. Um, we'll let T be an operator. Then we say a subspace of T, subspace U of T is invariance the fancy mathematical word another one to add to your pile of definitions a subspace is invariant under t if t takes u in actually let's not use that notation if u in u implies that T of U is also in U. If you started in the subspace and you do T to it, you end in the subspace as well. What was wrong with um, I'm, I'm just going to, because I was going to write this, but I haven't defined what this means yet.
D applied to the entire subspace lives in the subspace is what I was going to write. But I realized I hadn't actually told you that I could have taken an operator and apply it to an entire space yet. That's it. And this, what this line means is exactly what I wrote right here. Okay. So some examples of invariant subspaces, easy ones. I mean, invariant subspaces seem weird the first time, like the first time I saw them, I had no idea. Like, it was that um, zero is an invariant subspace. Under any, Under any operator. Of T because, well, T of zero is zero, which means that well, zero is an element of, of zero, right? So you put in zero, you get out zero. Zero is a subspace that's preserved by T. It's invariant under T. Um, all of V, these are the dumb ones. All of V is invariant under T because for any V in V. V is also in V. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yep. These are invariant under anything, but they're like, yeah, the, the point is that it, like, you have to start with an operator and it comes with a family of subspaces. For those of you that see where this is going, the eigenspaces are going to turn out to be the invariant subspaces. And eigenspaces of an operator change with the operator. So again, the matrix analogy here is I give you a matrix and I say, find the invariant subspaces. What I'm asking you to find is the eigenspaces. Okay? That's what to keep in mind here. This is what this is. These are, we're finding eigenspaces. So eigenspaces Ah, they're not unique to an operator, but if you know the eigenspaces, you, so knowing the eigenspaces is not enough to know the operator. Mm -hmm. Knowing the eigenspaces and the eigenvalues is not enough to know the operator. It's almost enough to know the operator. Um, th this is like, you're talking about some deeply complicated questions when you, when you ask that, right? So for those of you, again, that remember, if an operator is has a matrix that is diagonalizable, then knowing the eigenvalues and eigenvectors is almost enough to uniquely determine what the operator is. But yeah, it's like a fingerprint for an operator, right? And then if you just have like some map and you find out that T of zero is equal to zero, it's going to make that imply that T of zero is equal to zero. I mean, if T of zero is not zero, the map can't be linear, right? But that doesn't, you don't, you don't get the, you, that, that's the contrapositive of theorem, which says if t is linear, then t of zero is zero. So if t of zero is not zero, then t is not linear. I'm not, I'm saying here, this is true for any t. This is, this is always invariant for any t. This is always invariant for, yeah, these are all linear t, right? So we know this. So more interesting spaces are things like the null space of t is invariant. I don't go anywhere. Because if you start with a vector u in the null space of t, t applied to u is zero, which is also in the null space of t. So t takes in vectors in the null space and spits out vectors in the null space. So the null space is an invariant space. Yep. It does not have to be subjective. It just has to be, it has to map into itself in some way. Now, when they are subjections onto the, onto the invariant subspaces, um, that's going to correspond to certain behavior in the eigenvalues of the t. And finally, the range of t uh, is invariant under t because if v is in the range of t, certainly tv, this is trivial, right? If v is in the range of t, tv is also in the range of t. So it's also invariant. These are all invariant subspaces. Range gets mapped into range. No, no space gets mapped into no space. The whole space gets mapped into itself. The zero vector gets mapped into zero vector. Let's look at something that's got some more meat to it. So here's an example you've probably seen before. I'm going to define a map where I'm going to think about my vector space V as being equal to R2. And I'm going to define a map, an operator T 
it takes R2 to itself by TV is equal to one, two, two, one V. Take in a two, a two dimensional vector and multiply it by this matrix, okay? So, and then we're gonna let U be the subspace given by the span of the vector one, one. There's a subspace, there's a map. And notice, if I pick a vector U that's inside here, any U in U, uh, must be of the form u is equal to cc. That's what it means to be in the span of one one, right? Is to be of the form cc. So what's t of u? T of u is one two two one times cc, which is three c three c, which is three times cc. Now, is this vector in the span of one one? Sure, right? This was C times 1, 1. This is 3C times 1, 1. But this started in U, and this is also in U. This vector is in U, and this vector is also in U, because it's still in the span of 1, 1. So that means this is an invariant subspace for this map. This map preserves this U. And yes, I've sort of cheesily given you a really basic 206 eigenvalue <laughs> eigenvector equation here, but that's basically the idea is that any vector that pointed in this direction, when I put it through the map, comes out pointing in the same direction. So yep. in Only in the one dimensional case, which is the very first thing we're going to talk about. One dimensional invariant subspaces are always determined by scalar multiplication, always. When do there be We'll get there. Don't worry. No, those are good questions. Yep. I would say U is invariant under T, this map. U is invariant under T means T takes vectors in U and keeps them in U. And then it's, there's no accident that there's this extra number three floating out here. This is going to turn out to be this is an eigenvalue. Yeah. This is what we mean by an eigenvalue. It is the scalar multiplication. So we're we talking about scalar multiplication. This the scalar multiple that turns out to be well, how we define what it means to be an eigenvalue. And it's an eigenvalue for T. Or it's an eigenvalue for T. Oh, so it's like the equation T U equals. Yeah. So we're getting there. Don't worry. We're we're. It's going to start looking real familiar here in a second. I just want to give you an example that's not a, that's not a matrix map first as well. Okay, so now let's let V be equal to the infinite dimensional space P F, which is the space of polynomials of all degrees. Um, let U be the subspace given by so P three of F. Certainly, that's a subspace. Is that a U or a V? Oh, I'm going to pick the. So U is a subspace, right? The degree three or less polynomials are a subspace of the space of all polynomials. And let's let the map T um, go from uh, P3 of F into, well, let's just say T is going to be a linear map on P of F uh, given by T B is equal to P prime. So it takes the derivative. That's a linear map, derivatives are linear. Notice that T, uh, that P3 is invariant under T. Because if you put in a polynomial that's degree three or less, you get out a polynomial that's degree three or less. So you can actually view this as T is a map that takes in P3 of F, and I'll put it in this notation, T of P3 of F is a subset of P3 of F. I'm using this notation this time because somebody asked about surjectivity. The derivative eats all these degree th three polynomials or less and produces polynomials that are degree three or less, but it can't, this is not a surjective map because you can't ever map onto a polynomial that has degree three with the derivative, right? But the idea here is the P is in, P3, then P3 is also in P3. 
So th degree three polynomials are invariants of spaces under the derivative map. They're not subjective, but they are, they have this containment property. Starting in P3, lands you in P3. Yep. Sorry, sorry. So is T injective then? No. In fact, T is terribly not, it's like, T is not injective, nor is it subjective. It's not injective because the outputs, it destroys all constants, right? T of X squared plus one equals T of X squared. So this is 2x and this is also 2x, but those inputs were different. So it's not injective and it can't be surjective because you can't get a degree three polynomial out of a derivative of a degree three polynomial. So T is neither surjective nor injective, and yet it still has invariant subspaces. Essentially, yeah. Okay. So the next thing that we want to say is that, um, uh, well, let's look at dimension. We've talked about sort of, uh, Ari pointed out that like the scalar multiple thing, that actually turns out to characterize all the invariant subspaces of dimension one. The simplest possible invariant subspace would be an invariant subspace of dimension one. And the idea is if you were in invariant subspace of dimension one, then TV would have to be equal to lambda V. Right, if you imagine that you started with a space, U is equal to the span of some vector V, then that equation would certainly hold. That's what it would mean to be invariant, right? You put in V, you get out some scalar multiple of V. You started in this space with V, you land in the span of V, so some lambda fell out. On the other hand, if TV was equal to lambda V, for all, uh, let's say for some, for, sorry, for some lambda, So if you started with an invariant subspace, um, I'm sorry, if you started with a one dimensional space, then you could show that this equation held. If on the other hand, you have TV is equal to lambda V for some lambda, and that means that the span of V is invariant. So if the span of V was invariant, you get the lambda. If you have the lambda, you get the invariant subspace. So this equation, which every single person in the class should have permanently tattooed into your brain, like trauma inducing tattooed into your brain by your two oh six adventures in 206, right? Just have nightmares about TV is equal to lambda V. Not, not nightmares, good dream. Because like, what could be better than finding an eigenvalue? So you probably learned this under the, under the name eigenvalue equation. Something like this. A, V is equal to C, V or something like that. This equation, because we have this relationship between invariant subspaces and this equation holding for some lambda, this turns out to be how we define what it means to be an eigenvalue. Okay, so there's a relationship between invariant subspaces and this equation holding for some lambda. When you say a span of v, what does that mean? Like the span of v math or? So what would I mean if I say the span of v is invariant? What I mean is um, anything in here would have the property that T of some vector, well, where would T put V? If the span of V was invariant, what would T of V have to do? Well, T of V would be an element of the span of V, right? That's what it means to be invariant. V, if V is in the span of V, <coughs> which it is, then T V would also be in the span of V. But what does it mean to be in the span of V? It means that you're a linear combination of V. <coughs> What's a linear combination of one vector? Yeah, what is this? The span of one vector is what? Of one scalar times V, right? 
So if you were in the span of V, then there must exist a scalar so that this is true. Yep. So what I'm saying is if the span of V was invariant, then this equation would have had to hold for some lambda. And if this equation holds for some lambda, that forces the span to be invariant. Yep. So is that statement an if and only? <coughs> it's more, it's an if and only if, but it's more a motivation for what we're going to make the definition, which is an if and only if. So we're going to say a one-dimensional invariant subspace forces this equation to hold for some lambda. And on the other hand, if this equation held for some lambda, then the span would be invariant. So it's an if and only if, but not a theorem. We're going to use it as a definition. Okay. All definitions are if and only. So here's our big definition. <laughs> Suppose P is an LV number lambda called an eigenvalue P. There exists a vector v and v with v is equal to m. Yep. Quite yeah, I mean, it's cool. I'm saying v complex. That number's a number. Don't discriminate. They're better than real numbers. Come on, man. Okay. So in the equation that I put up before, um, I had that example T that took R2 to R2 by T of C1, C2 is equal to um, 1, 2, Q1 times C1, C2. That's a map on all of R2. I showed you that T of anything that looks like CC is equal to 1, 2, 2, 1 of CC, which is equal to 3 times CT. And what that means is 3 is an eigenvalue of this map. Because so this 3 is an eigenvalue. Because TV is equal to 3V. TV equals 3V. There exists a vector that makes this equation true. Make sense? And the vector actually mat like matters too, right? So V, which in this example is the vector CC, is going to be called an eigenvector. I haven't defined eigenvector yet in a general sense, but I'm just trying to point out that structurally we get everything at the same time. Right? V is equal to CC is called an eigenvector associated to lambda is equal to three. So eigenvalues come along with eigenvectors. Always. So you can't have an eigenvector An eigenvector doesn't float around by itself, and eigenvalues always come with something. We haven't defined it yet, but yes, right? I like the, the, it's going to turn out to be the case that if you can do this, the vector v that solves this equation turns out to be that's what we're going to define to be an eigenvector. So this equation gives us everything. Now it doesn't. Yep. Sorry, what? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, we got to be careful here. All of this assumes that. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. We got a lot to put in the zero vector, right? The zero vector is like sort of a fake vector. It is. Yeah, but trivially, right? We don't want to, we're going to allow for the fact that lambda could be zero because lambda equals zero is going to cover the null space. The null space turns out to be an I, like that, those are, that, the null space is the space of vectors that goes with the eigenvalue zero. You don't want to let V be equal to zero because remember, zero doesn't have a basis. 
zero as a subspace, zero vector is like, there's no basis for it, right? It's a, it's a dumb subspace. So we don't want to allow it to be included. So yeah, absolutely it's the case that we don't allow this equation to be solved by B is equal to zero. B is equal to zero doesn't get to count. Doesn't play this game. You are, so this, that's why there's, I haven't given you any method at all. There's no method yet for finding any of these things. I wrote you an example and waved my hand. You know, there's some magic in the background. And if you look at my notes, you can see where I did it. You know, there's a, I did a little eigenvector calculation on the side here to make sure I cooked up my example correctly. But yeah, I have given you no information about how to find these things. I'm giving you an example of what they are and how they work. And then you have to hope that I'm going to tell you how to do this before I give you homework exercises to say to find them. Okay. So I'm giving you no information about how to find them. And you're right. This is a, like, there's, we're gonna have to come up with a clever way of doing this because finding the eigenvalues and finding the eigenvectors are two separate problems. And we need to do something else because I have one equation with two unknowns in it. Now in your 206 class, the way you did this was, if you remember, this is forbidden in this class, by the way, because Axler wrote an entire paper about how this is trash. In your 206 class, what you did was this. You said, ah, oh, well, I can get more information in this problem by noticing that I can compute the determinant of A minus lambda. I only work with the matrices. I'm going to compute this determinant. And the determinant being equal to zero corresponds to the matrix not being invertible, which means that there's some vectors that solve this <laughs> equation. So you did one step where you use this to figure out the lambdas. And then you went back and computed null spaces to figure out the eigenvectors. Okay? We're not doing that. No determinants. The paper that this whole book is written off the basis of is called Down with Determinants. So there's not going to be any of this. We're going to do no characteristic equations unless you survive the 406 at the very end and then you get the characteristic equation at the end of that. Okay? We're going to have a completely different sort of uh, abstract approach to figuring out what's going on. Okay? Now, in some sense, it's sort of a curse because we have to work harder, but we're also working more with the bones of mathematics when we do it. And in some sense, it's a blessing because who the hell wants to sit around and compute factor of polynomials of degree five so that you can figure out what the eigenvalues are? When you, if it's a matrix, you can just ask a computer to tell you what the eigenvalues are. So that, if you manage to take some complicated equation and stuff it into matrix form and ask uh, the, the algorithm do it. I'm going to have to painstakingly write down the reference, the physical representation of every single thing that the computer did to get there. Okay. So you have to be careful about about what. I, it's okay. So if you got to be really cautious. This is not a matrix statement. This is a statement about a general linear map. However, however, we do remember that I can always think about TV by transforming it into the matrix of T times the matrix of T, right? So I could, like, I have this back and forth relationship between TV and these matrices. So the matrix of T times the matrix of V would be equal to lambda times the matrix of V. So there is a corresponding, all of your 206 stuff lives over here under the isomorphism of the matrices, but you're not allowed to do it. It's just over there waiting for you, but we're not doing that. The point of this is we want to understand what's going on here without having to refer to, because otherwise we actually have to define what the determinant is. And I don't know if you've ever seen definition of a determinant in an algebraic setting. This is awful. Because if you imagine for a second what the determinant must be, it's defined differently for every single side matrix. There's a different definition. You know, the iterative process gained by working with the principal minors, like the cofactors and the sign matrix, or you can think of it as a, a sign preserving map on the space of permutations. Like, you don't want to do that, right? We don't want to deal with determinants. This is an ill defined operation. When they give it to you in 206, it's because they're just teaching you an algorithm. They're not trying to give you any understanding at all, uh, like from the mathematical standpoint, of why this works not for a map or not for a matrix, but for a general map. You don't want to have to refer to matrices. Matrices are sort of they're parallel to what we're doing, but they're not what we're doing. Okay. What we're doing is deeper than that. 
And in fact, this same sort of argument would even work largely. Um, this stuff works in infinite dimensions. For example, what is the derivative of e to the 2x? Oh, that looks an awful lot like tv is equal to lambda v. So what I've said here, by writing this down, I mean, d is a linear operator on the space of differentiable functions. That says that e to the 2x is an eigenvector. Sorry, that 2 is an eigenvalue of d. 2 is an eigenvalue of d. And the eigenvector that goes with it, d is equal to e to the 2x, is an eigenvector. I have no way to write this down as a matrix and do this, but the notion of what it means to be an eigenvalue and an eigenvector works even in infinite dimensions and for functions. And so we don't want to strap ourselves to matrices when where linear algebra goes eventually is stuff like this, where you're doing it to functions instead of column vectors and Rn. Okay. That's why we're trying to like be bigger in our vision. Also, Axler wants to teach you guys how to do proofs. Yep. Well, I would say, I mean, with respect to, well, no, two is just an eigenvalue. I don't have to say with respect to anything. Two is an eigenvalue of B. E to the two X is an eigenvector with respect to lambda is equal to two. Eigenvectors come attached to eigenvalues, but eigenvalues exist independently. Uh, that's a good question. So we're just we're just getting our toes wet here, but yes, it's not that they're they're unique. It's that they you could, that the eigen the space of all it's going to turn out to be the case that eigen that the span of the eigenvectors associated with a particular eigenvalue is a subspace. That's kind of where it is. Are eigenvalues always a square? Yes, and in fact, that's why that's precisely why we have to restrict ourselves to this space. Right. This corresponds to square matrices. Now, if in your 206 class, you basically thought about this in terms of determinants, right? Determinants only make sense on square matrices. You did it with determinants. Okay, so here's a theorem. If D is finite dimensional, so let's say D is finite dimensional, D is an LV. Following our well, there's an abbreviation I haven't used in here yet, but that means the following are equivalent. This is how you figure out something as an eigenvalue without having to use determinants. Lambda is an eigenvalue. T minus lambda i is not injective. T minus lambda i is not surjective. D T minus lambda i is not invertible. To remind you a lot of the theorem we started this class with today. Okay, so if I say the following are equivalent, these are equivalent to each other by the theorem I wrote down at the beginning, right? To not be injective, to not be surjective, to not be invertible are equivalent. Where does that come in? Lambda is an eigenvalue for t. Well, if lambda is an eigenvalue for t, and that means there exists a v so that <laughs> Tv is equal to lambda v. But that means t minus i lambda of v is equal to zero. And that means v is in the null space. V is in the null space of t minus lambda i. Now, why do we have to assume v is not the zero vector? Because I want this to be a non zero vector. If it's a non zero vector, that means. What do I know about the dimension of the null space? Dimension of the null space 
of t minus sine to i is bigger or equal to one because there's at least one vector inside of it. And that implies what about t minus sine to i? If there's a null space that has something in it not injected. That gives you A implies B. Yeah. Well, it's a linear combination of operators on, since, it's a, since I is an operator on B and lambda, yeah, basically it's because LB is a vector space that linear combinations of maps on B are themselves maps on B. Okay. Now, you should recognize that in your old classes, this is the thing that you just beat the hell out of, right? This, the fact that the determinant would be equal to zero is basically saying the map is not injected. But we're not going to get to do that. Instead, we're going to get a lot of ground out of the um, fundamental theorem of linear maps. This is a setup that makes the fundamental theorem of linear maps actually operate. But that sort of balance of dimensions of spaces is going to be involved. And now it's not spaces associated with T anymore. It's space is associated with t minus lambda i. Okay. So go ahead and read the rest of this argument. These are equivalent by the first theorem. You still need to know how we prove this direction. You guys should go read how to go back this way. These are all equivalent. A implies B, but we don't have an arrow that points back to A. So read that when you go home today. And next time we're going to talk about uh, eigenvectors and how we started like building up to discovering these things, how we compute them. All right, we'll see you next time. Oh, yeah, the new homework is posted if you want to get ahead. <laughs>